Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Fuller, Communications Officer with the UNEP Enlighten Initiative, and welcome to today's webinar. Our feature presentations are focused on the Enlighten Initiative and the section of the Efficient Lighting Toolkit that deals specifically with the environmentally sound management of lighting products. And this is Section 5, entitled Safeguarding the Environment and Health. We're fortunate to have two expert panelists representing the United Nations program and Philips Lighting presenting on this topic today. Before we begin, I'll quickly go over some of the webinar features. For audio, you have two options. You may either listen through your computer or over your telephone. If you choose to listen through your computer, please select the microphone and speakers option in the audio pane on the right-hand side of the screen. By doing so, we will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. If you select the telephone option, a box on the right side will display the telephone number and audio pin should you use, use it to dial in. We ask that you please mute your audio device before the presentations begin. If you have any te technical difficulties at all with the webinar, you may contact the GoToWebinars help desk at 888-259-3826 for assistance. We welcome you to introduce yourself, and you can do so by typing into the chat pane located on your screen. If you'd like to ask a question, we ask that you use the questions pane, where you can type in your question. And you can type in your question at any point during the presentations, and afterwards an audio recording in the presentations will be posted on the Enlightened Initiative website. You can also ask additional questions from the Contact Us feature on our website. So we have a really exciting agenda prepared for you today that's focused on the importance of environmentally sound management of lighting products. Catherine Conway from the United Nations Environment Program will provide information from the Enlighten Initiative's Efficient Lighting Toolkit, and Andrew Brookie will go into detail about best practices for the collection and recycling of lamps. Before our speakers begin their presentations, I'll provide a short informative overview of the Enlighten Initiative. And then following the presentations, we'll have a question and answer session and wrap up the discussion with closing remarks. So the Enlighten Initiative was established in 2009 to accelerate a global transformation to energy efficient lighting. We've set a target date that by the end of 2016, all countries should have either phased out inefficient incandescent lamps or have policies in place to phase out within an identified time frame. The initiative provides expert guidance, recommendations, and tools to assist developing and emerging countries to achieve a transition to efficient lighting. This includes the harmonization and promotion of minimum energy performance standards, or MEPS, and recommendations that include global best practices. The Global Partnership Program is a key initiative in the Enlighten, it is a key initiative in the Enlighten, and it provides technical advice and targeted research and support for the coordination of regional activities around the world. So far, 46 countries have joined the partnership, and pilot workshops are currently being held in selected countries around the world. The Enlighten Initiative is an excellent example of a successful private partner public-private partnership, and it's supported by the Global Environment Facility and partners Philips Lighting, Osram AG, and the National Test Center of China. To achieve a transition following an integrated approach, the initiative is providing key resources to countries, and here are just some examples of these resources. Enlighten has convened government representatives and international lighting experts from over 40 organizations to provide technical, policy, and capacity building support as part of our expert task forces. Country lighting assessments have been developed for over 100 countries and highlight the potential savings that can be realized by each country with a shift to efficient lighting in the residential, commercial, industrial, and outdoor lighting sectors. The new Global Efficient Lighting Policy Map rates activity levels for the four elements of the integrated policy approach in the residential sector, and it shows the readiness of countries to transition to efficient lighting. The Efficient Lighting Toolkit, which we're discussing today, Section 5, as I mentioned earlier, has been developed to communicate the benefits and tools necessary for the widespread adoption of efficient, efficient lighting. It's available as an ebook format online, and it is in Spanish, French, and English currently, and will be translated into Arabic and Russian and online shortly in those languages. The new Enlightened 
Learning Microsite provides countries with tools, expert advice, presentations, policy information, and technical resources. And a global policy dialogue will be convened in 2013 to address policy issues and the emergence of LEDs. At this prominent event, a global lighting status report will be released for review and input. Lastly, the UNEP Collaborating Center has been launched in Beijing, China as a partnership between UNEP and the National Lighting Test Center. It's an accredited facility that provides lighting testing, training, advice, quality control, and capacity building to support developing and emerging countries. So as you can see, the Enlightened Initiative provides a wide range of support for all countries and stakeholders interested in a rapid transition to energy efficient lighting. Now I'd like to provide a brief introduction to our distinguished panelists. We are joined by our guest speaker, Mr. Andrew Brookie, who is responsible for global corporate sustainability at Philips Lighting. His most recent undertaking included a pilot to collect and recycle end-of-life lamps across Indonesia. In addition, he's involved in establishing a Lamp Collection and Recycling Service Organization, or CSO, in South Africa. Our next panelist, or first panelist of today, will be Catherine Conway. She's a program officer in the Division of Technology, Industry, and Economics at UNEP, who provides technical support to the Enlighten Initiative. She's an expert in energy efficient lighting technologies and energy policy. She's previously a professor and a consultant, and Catherine has more than two decades of experience in global lighting market transformation efforts. So at this point, I'd like to pass the um, presentation over to Catherine. Hello. Hello. Greetings to everyone around the world who is listening in. This morning, uh, or it's morning in Paris. Good morning and good evening to those of you listening uh, from the other side of the world. I'm going to briefly introduce the Efficient Lighting Toolkit, point out Section 5, Safeguarding the Environment and Health, briefly run over some conclusions from Section 5 of the toolkit, and give you some questions and answers um, time at the end of this webinar session. The Efficient Lighting Toolkit is a resource that is available now as an e-book in English and Spanish. You can access it at our website. We'll soon have it available in Arabic, French, and Russian. The toolkit is aimed at government officials, energy agencies, environmental groups, distributors, retailers, and civic sector leaders. It offers policy and technical tools, including templates. It has resources such as case studies, and it describes types of financing that you can use, um, arrange to finance programs such as the CSRO programs. It gives guidance on ensuring product quality in the market and focuses on environmental sustainability. The toolkit has six sections plus an overview and a glossary. I'd like to point out that it's based on the integrated policy approach that the United Nations promotes. We have contributions in the toolkit from many experts, including today's panelists. It's not advancing. The elements of the integrated policy approach are like a puzzle. The cornerstone is minimum energy performance standards. Along with these minimum standards that set the bar for products that can be in the marketplace, we need supporting policies. The supporting policies include types of financing, such as rebates, incentives, and communications programs. Monitoring, verification, and enforcement is critical for making sure that the products that are in the marketplace actually deliver the savings and the benefits that we expect. And finally, today we're going to talk about environmentally sound management. This is a key part of the integrated policy approach, and with all four parts of the approach in place, we can achieve sustainable lighting. In Section 5, we're focused on three parts of the life cycle of lighting, lamp production, usage, and end-of-life issues. We also touch on carbon, material, and water consumption footprints. We take a look at mercury in lamps versus mercury emissions from fossil fuel combustion. 
and we give practical guidelines on how to communicate technical issues to end users. When we have an environmentally sound management scheme, this provides regulators with a framework to manage the impact of goods and services at all life cycle stages. In production, we're looking to minimize toxicity and design and manufacturing. During the usage phase, which is the greatest impact of any lighting product, we're also trying to avoid breakage, especially of lamps that are uh, operating with mercury. So we call these mercury added lamps and you would recognize the compact fluorescent lamp as an example of a mercury added lamp. For the end of life phase, we're looking at best practices, management of systems, and financing. And this is where our guest panelist Andrew Brookie will be focusing. For international policies, we want to point out that there is the Basel Convention on the Control of Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste and also the UNEP facilitated Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee on Reducing Mercury Pollution. In the production phase, the toolkit addresses three general types of lamps. Filament lamps, which are incandescent and tungsten halogen incandescent lamps. Compact fluorescent lamps, either bare bulbs or ones that are covered with a globe. And light emitting diode lamps. These are the newest lamps, and while the technology is still emerging, we have some life cycle studies that are being done to compare all three types of lamps and show where in the life cycle there are concerns, how these concerns are being addressed by industry, and how the lamps can be collected and recycled and reused, uh, the components reused at end of life. During the usage phase, electricity consumption accounts for the major environmental impact of lamps. This is because combustion of fossil fuels emits mercury into the atmosphere. It disperses mercury all throughout the environment. Efficient lamps reduce mercury emissions because they have lower energy usage over the lamp lifetime. This is one reason it's very important to have monitoring, verification, and enforcement programs in place because if you're promoting energy efficient lamps, you want them to last their full lifetime and you want to drastically reduce the electricity consumption from lighting. In terms of regulating hazardous substances, we bring this issue up because the widespread adoption of energy efficient lamps puts attention on issues regarding hazardous substances. I'm sure you've all seen media articles um, people expressing concern about mercury in lamps, asking questions about how to handle them, asking whether they're safe to use. So there's increasing government and public sensitivity to mercury and also to electronic waste concerns. The good news is that te technical advances enable many lamp manufacturers to reduce the amount of lead, mercury, and other materials in their products. I'll give you just a few examples of regulations and voluntary initiatives regarding mercury in lamps. This is not a comprehensive list, but it does point out that some of the very large markets in the world are limiting the amount of mercury in lamps. In China, there is a limit of 5 milligrams for compact fluorescent lamps, and there are also incentive programs in place for purchasing lamps that have very low mercury content, less than 1.5 milligrams. Colombia has made a limit on mercury and fl compact fluorescent lamps, as have Russia, Korea, and Turkey. These countries um, have followed the lead of Europe, which has a directive in place called the Restriction of Hazardous Substances, also known as ROSE. It's very common if you look in a catalog of lamps to see ROSE-compliant lamps. This directive establishes progressively lower levels of mercury in CFLs. The levels are updated every four years to take advantage of the advances in technology. The limit is 2.5 milligrams by very soon, um, the beginning of 2013. In the ongoing negotiations between governments, there is a 3.5 milligram 
limit for lamps less than 30 watts that is proposed. And this is open for comment now. The next meeting is in January 2013. In the United States, a voluntary industry initiative has lowered compact fluorescent lamp mercury levels quite drastically, and also lowered the levels of mercury in linear fluorescent lamps. While I won't go into great detail on this diagram, I urge you to take a look at the chapter in the toolkit because each of the phases of the life cycle is described in detail for each type of lamp. And this is the circular diagram where we hope to see that all the natural resources that are used to make lamps eventually are recovered after use and put back into the manufacturing cycle. Andrew will have some more comments about this. In the future, programs should also take a look at how to responsibly manage other types of spent lamps, such as LEDs. They will be handled as electronic waste. The most important thing to communicate to consumers and to all users is if they're using compact fluorescent lamps, they should avoid breakage. When a CFL breaks, there is a rapid release of mercury vapor in the first few minutes after breakage. This produces a short-term peak of airborne mercury, but this declines rapidly over the first hour. Some countries mandate that cleanup directions be readily available to consumers on websites or in package inserts. There can also be point of purchase instructions, and many communications campaigns include messages that help consumers learn how to deal with a broken lamp. The best practices are outlined in the toolkit, and they are in a form that you can excerpt and use in your own programs. I'll spend a few minutes talking about financial mechanisms and responsibilities for funding collection programs. There are many different options. Um, I'll work through them, and then Andrew will give some examples of how this plays out in the marketplace. In the first method, full costs are internalized. The producer is responsible and the costs are passed on to end users. Another option is to have a visible or invisible advanced disposal fee. This is called an eco fee. It's visible to the consumer or it could also be invisible and collected from the buyer or the producer. Perhaps more familiar is a deposit that is later refunded. This is done with many uh, bottle collection programs and sometimes with electronics devices. Consumers pay a deposit and then it is refunded on the return of the spent lamp. A few more methods for financing are the last owner pays. This is where the consumer pays a fat, flat fee for disposal. Or a regional collection and recycling program. This is where multiple countries or multiple communities collaborate on collection and recycling. The laws if it is transboundary, have to be harmonized. And if the collected lamps are moved across borders, there may be a requirement to obtain exemptions for any guidelines that apply to the international or national laws. Now I'll just jump to some conclusions. The efficient lamps that we use are responsible for lower global mercury and greenhouse gas emissions than our incandescent lamps. The widespread adoption of energy efficient lamps requires sound management at all life cycle stages. As we noted before, compliant high quality lamps are essential for minimizing life cycle impacts and also for delivering the expected benefits. We urge policymakers to consider international best practices as they determine what is best for their countries. As you'll see from Andrew's presentation, recycling is manageable it can be affordable and it can create new jobs. Extended producer responsibility can be a very effective approach. The Basel guidelines on hazardous waste management will help eliminate release of the hazardous materials into the environment. And finally, we'll point out that success requires legislative frameworks, sustainable funding, clear communication, and the participation of all parties. I hope with this introduction I've set the tone for what I think will be a very interesting look at some real-world collection and recycling efforts. So I'll turn it over now to Laura, who will introduce Andrew. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Catherine. Okay, and now I'd like to invite Andrew Brookie from Philips Lighting to please continue on with his presentation. Uh, hello to everybody. Thank you for joining this webinar. So my presentation is focused around um, an introduction of best practice guides to the collection and recycling of lamps. Um, excuse me, I'm just organising my screen at this end. So um, based on the um, cooperation that Philips has undertaken with various lighting industries, the objective is to implement and optimise environmentally and financially sustainable collection and recycling service organisations, what we refer to as CRSOs. Uh, this is for end of life lamps, uh, uh, which we want to tailor to the specific country requirements. So the various uh, logos you see there represent all the CRSO implementations in the uh, member countries to the European Union when they introduced their directive for uh, electronic waste, which they refer to as the WEEE directive. What we now see is a basic overview of the flow of the end of life lamps and how they should be managed by the CRSO. So um, the end of life lamps are sourced from the, the end user who must separate the end of life lamp at the, um, at the time that they enter the waste stream. The end user can be you or me, uh, it can be derived from a professional source uh, such as uh, industrial users. Uh, but also obviously private households. The end of life lamps uh, from the end users require collection in purpose built containers, storage, the logistics and handling of them where there is one stream that goes to recycling and reuse which is the preferred. Uh, if recycling and or reuse is not possible of the end of life lamps then um, as a last resort there should be disposal uh, to hazardous waste landfill sites. Uh, what type of lamps should be collected at end of life? Obviously, as mentioned, compact fluorescent lamps, other fluorescent lamps, straight tubes, round tubes, high intensity discharge lamps and LEDs. Where should the lamps be collected from an end of life point of view? There are public collection points that could be put in place such as hospitals, schools, post offices, restaurants, malls, other retail sites. Uh, Anywhere where public access is possible, it's, it's potentially uh, to, the potential is there to place a container to collect the end of life lamps. Uh, professional end users such as large installers, uh, lamp maintenance programs, relamping activity by municipalities for example or electrical distribution. Typically this is where the larger quantities of end of life lamps are sourced. Mobile curbside collection vehicle services are also possible um, where maybe there is not easy access for the public to get to a collection point. Uh, consideration could be given to providing a, a mobile vehicle collection of end of life lamps from um, areas where they cannot readily access a public collection point. Also curbside is being practiced in some countries where uh, a special purpose resellable bag is used to place the end of life lamp in and it's actually collected. Uh, from the curve side. Online mail order is also possible and being used in some countries where again a, a, a special purpose sellable bag is used to mail the end of life lamp through to be recycled. 
the sealable bag reduces the risk of mercury seepage from lamps that may be broken in transit. Uh, a waste merchant uh, is a centre that would provide uh, a, a buying and selling of recyclable um, materials at predetermined prices and they act as a broker between formal collection activities as well as informal collection. I now want to focus on the collection aspect of, of a CRSO because this is where the majority of effort is required. Um, what we find is a best practice container to use that's specific to, to lamps is the foldable version um, that is manufactured in Spain. Uh, it is one that we are using for our pilot in Indonesia as well. The advantages are that it is foldable and very efficient in terms of logistics, uh, moving it to and from collection points. Uh, it can carry a mix of different lamps as you see illustrated in one of the photos there. It has a possibility for a track and trace capability. Um, it's, it's very suitable for your large installers, maintenance, relamping, uh, professional end user use. There are thousands of examples of smaller containers that that could be used to collect lamps. Um, these are typically for public collection points where, uh, as you see, they have in the illustration what's called a soft drop uh, internal ramp where a CFL, for example, can be placed in the container. Uh, the soft drop uh, eases its fall to the bottom so it doesn't break. These are typically um, much smaller volumes of collection but they're very cheap to deploy and you can have thousands of them placed around uh, the, the public collection points that were mentioned earlier. Um, I want to give uh, an example from Indonesia of the, um, <clears throat> the importance of having incentivized collection when you establish a, a CRSO. What we found in that market uh, with a very dense population, um, with 17,000 islands, of which 7,000 are inhabited in terms of managing the logistics and building up the volume of waste to be collected. A key challenge there was to, to increase the collection of CFLs from households, which as I mentioned there is typically below the level of waste that you would derive from professional end users. What they have in Indonesia is a waste bank network, which effectively is a bank that's dedicated to uh, the collection of, of waste that can be recycled and it incentivizes the household. So a household would, would get a waste bank book as you see illustrated there. Um, then inside that waste bank book uh, on the left hand side, as the household um, has its waste separated and collected, that can be recycled, it will, will receive the equivalent of cash deposits. So this is all sorts of um, recyclable waste which can include and does include end of life lamps, um, more typically things like plastic bottles, glass and so on. The household builds up cash equivalent in its waste bank book. Once they've reached a certain amount on the left hand side, the household can actually go to the waste bank and withdraw cash. Um, which typically happens uh, during festive holidays during the year and it's a system um, that works across all of Indonesia, it's very effective. Uh, the household is absolutely incentivized um, to participate because simply they, they receive cash incentives for separating their waste that can be then collected and recycled, very effective. Another example of um, incentivized collection is uh, a reverse vending machine here that you see was invented in Norway in fact. Uh, indeed it has the technology to recycle CFL and LED lamps. Uh, similar to the um, smaller container box that you see it has a more sophisticated soft drop system so that when the lamp is deposited uh, it gets lowered and minimizes breakage. There is an internal mercury fume extractor so that there is no mercury release. Um, and the incentivization comes when the household uh, deposits the end of life lamp. So if you look at the left hand side of the, 
of the vending machine, you see a, like a TV monitor, you see a black circle. The end user will deposit their end of life lamp in that black circle and in the black uh, rectangle they will receive a reward incentive voucher that the end user can then use to purchase a product at a discount or some other sales incentive. The left hand side there's another round, uh, black circle. Um, that's the, the same principle that's being used for the return of batteries which is another category of electrical waste. Again, it's, it's a, it's a directly, it directly incentivizes the end user to um, separate the waste that can be recycled and it incentivizes them. Another common example um, to, to gain coverage of, of your collection network for the CRSL is to have a, a multi-product container for small categories of e-waste. And in this example you see from the left to the right um, uh, the potential to collect batteries, paper, plastic bottles and CFL lamps. Space efficient and it, it's, it's a synergy in terms of joint collection of waste and um, it's been found in more and more retail sites across the world. A very important sector that requires um, engagement is, is the informal salvages. Um, the waste pickers who collect and, and even sometimes buy recyclable waste pack them on their form of transport, transport them, sell them for a profit to sorters who then ship off the, the waste that's been collected by uh, the informal sector for processing. This form of recycling network is a low-tech solution but one that works very, very well. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it can employ many thousands if not millions of people depending on which market you might be in. As I mentioned, engagement of the informal sector is necessary um, because you can come to an agreement to formalise the waste volumes that they have collected and it can also help from a governmental point of view create formal employment too. Um, the bottom photo uh, shows a uh, informal uh, collection and recycling effort for a CFL lamp. Um, typically the knowledge of the informal sector is that uh, when they get CFLs the value is in, in the plastic end, uh, not so much in, in the glass which also can be recycled, which does contain phosphor powders and, and as well as a uh, mix of mercury. Uh, so what you're seeing there is not from a, from a health and safety point of view satisfactory, um, but that's how the informal sector is and, and there is a need for education in that respect so that they understand that the full lamp can be recycled. It's not just a component of it but the entire lamp. So from end users to uh, the collection effort with, with specific containers, we come on to storage. Um, so obviously once we've got the, the, the end of life lamps containerized, they need to be stored warehoused and typically uh, hazardous licenses will be, will be required to store the waste. Um, it's important there's good contingency planning at the warehouse uh, and training of the workers if there is breakage of the end of life lamps, um, that they know exactly what to do in terms of clean up procedure and so on. Uh, as mentioned earlier, there is uh, mercury vapour, that, that peaks at a certain time, so you want to be able to ventilate and, and use, for example, as shown here, uh, spill control kits. Uh, across the um, collection of the, of the lamps and containerization and storages is the need for logistics, obviously, to shift, shift things around. Um, as I've said there, when the volumes start to increase, specialised logistic providers will be required with dedicated fleets to handle the above special purpose containers. They will also require licence to deal with hazardous waste. Logistically, the waste is collected, consolidated at take-back storage sites and then transported onto the recycler. As the CRSO grows in its volumes, um, it's best to have an online logistics system that can track and trace the containers and 
and trucking logistic provider. So why recycle lamps? It is the safest way to deal with the hazardous materials that they contain in the lamps. Uh, it prevents the hazardous substances from entering landfill, so um, it, it is a way to prevent mercury seepage into landfill, which is really important to the environment. Uh, also, it reduces the demand for raw materials as primary processing is more energy intensive than recycling. So secondary reuse of raw materials that are recovered from recycling is a, is a stated objective of the Basel Convention. How to recycle lamps. There are various types of technologies that work and I'm giving one example today um, which is MRT from Sweden. This is a compact crush and separation plant. Uh, it's self-contained and the illustration is, is an internal one. The recycling equipment is in the equivalent of a 20-foot container that you could find on the back of a truck. So uh, this container can be fixed or re relocated uh, and used as a mobile plant. Um, within the container, the air is brought to a sub pressure that prevents mercury from being released into the environment. So how it works, um, if you visualise uh, a 20 foot container and this is what's inside, the end of life lamps are fed into the, the container, um, all, the, all the separation, um, securing of the mercury is internalised and then you are left with the outputs that can be recycled and reused. So what are the lamps recycled into? Well, um, recycling allows the direct reuse in the manufacture of lighting equipment. So end of life lamps can be recycled and can be reused and remanufactured to make new lighting equipment. Uh, the material recovery rate from recycling typically will exceed 95%. So it's, it's a pretty effective cradle-to-cradle -cradle solution. Um, the the uh, illustration there basically shows that the recycling enables distillation and the recovery of mercury and reuse. So again, you are, your secondary reuse of the mercury reduces the uh, intensive primary um, extraction of mercury from the environment. There are alternative industrial uses for the recycled materials from lamps. One example is that the glass can be used for building insulation. Another example is that the mercury can be used as a dental amalgam. The aluminium can be reused and so on. From the, uh, the flow of the end of life lamps, I mentioned that the waste stream can be recycled and reused. However, if, if recycling is not a possibility as a, as a last resort, um, the need to disposal has to be considered. The symbol you see is the one from the EU that they use for their WEEE directive for e-waste, where they're basically saying do not dispose. If this is a scenario to be considered, then because it is hazardous waste, uh, it can't go to the general waste stream landfill, it must go to hazardous waste site only. When undertaking um, the transition from incandescent to energy efficient lighting, which then builds the momentum to start up a CRSO, the government involvement and, and the need to communicate the benefits of the conversion from incandescent to energy efficient lighting is important. So that's one communication that needs to happen. As a CRSO is established, uh, it's very important that the CRSO communicates building an awareness for end users that lamps cannot be recycled, can be recycled, excuse me. The, 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 the end user's perception is that lamps cannot be recycled, but they can. So there has to be extensive communication to build awareness that end of life lamps can be recycled by the end users. Similarly, the CRSO has to communicate um, where the lamps can be um, deposited for collection and recycling. So they also have to make it convenient. They've got to first build the awareness that you can recycle and then um, 
communicate the convenience of where the recycling can take place so the end user is engaged to actually place the end of life lamp in a container or have it collected so that it can be recycled. In terms of financing the CRSO, uh, the preferred approach is to do so via a visible fee. So um, from the initial uh, workflow you now see what's called a green light CRSO, it's a generic name for uh, a CRSO that you could create in your market. Uh, you see on the left hand side the green arrows which indicate the, the funding of the CRSO where in fact the, uh, the end user would pay at the point of purchase a visible fee via the producer, the one who would sell the product or directly to Greenlight CRSO. That would provide the funding for the collection and recycling activity. That is represented by the red arrows where the funding uh, is then used to finance the collection, storage, logistic, recycling and if necessary disposal activity. Typically the CRSO would operate on a not-for-profit basis so there is no excessive uh, cost burden on the end user um, in order to achieve a satisfactory level of collection and recycling of end-of-life lamps. In addition to this, government oversight is critical um, and they provide the platform for the regulation and monitoring for the Greenlight CRSO who in turn are reporting and providing compliance to the government in terms of the running of the CRSO in a financially and environmentally sustainable manner. Differentiating lamps to other types of e-waste um, the collection and recycling of lamps is considerably different to other end-of-life uh, e-waste. They have many specific characteristics which should be considered for government regulation. So lamps are, are fragile and hazardous um, as opposed to say another type of uh, e-waste, a, a large domestic appliance such as a refrigerator which is obviously far more robust. Lamps uh, are low in individual weight with many different shapes in terms of uh, the collection dynamic. There's an extremely high volume of lamps that are put on the market every year in terms of sales. At the end of life they have no residual value. There is the new LED technology as part of a consideration for um, building up a CRSO. There are specific collection and treatment requirements to lamps and importantly no distinction can be made between the household and professional end user as a source of end of life lamps. So these dynamics have to be considered uh, as, a, as a government looks to regulate the collection and recycling of uh, lamp e-waste. So in conclusion, lamps are very different. Uh, the recommendation is that there be one financially and environmentally sustainable CRSO specifically for lamps. Uh, the advantages of that is it uh, provides a, a single oversight from the government uh, and transparency in terms of uh, auditing of its uh, operations. It should involve the whole country market lamp industry so that uh, everybody is, um, is fulfilling the same obligations for the end of life lamps uh, based on what they have put on the market based on their market share uh, and should be based on strongly enforced lamp specific regulation. Excellent. Andrew, thank you so much. That was an excellent presentation and Catherine, thank you to you as well. Um, I think we're going to take the time now to go through some questions and um, we can answer and discuss them in the remaining time. So I'm going to go to the first question with you, Andrew, and it's um, a three-part question. So let's start with what legislation is most important for establishing CRS CRSOs? Is any type of legislation a barrier? And if so, how do you overcome the barriers? 
Okay. Um, there are there are a number of elements to um, successful government regulation, um, and there are, there are there is a, an example of something not to do. So if I firstly focus on um, concepts and elements of successful government government regulation. Um, there is the principle of what's called the producer responsibility. So that's the producer is the one basically selling the lamp onto the market, having the responsibility at the end of life stage for its uh, environmentally sound, uh, let's say, recycling and disposal if necessary. Um, and from that producer responsibility, it's ideal to have a collective financing scheme uh, using the CRSO example. Uh, it's important to um, encourage and, and possibly incentivise to maximise separate collection of the e-waste. It's important to um, have very well thought out information for users so they can see when they purchase the lamp uh, at, the t at the point of sale that there's a certain amount of uh, fee that is being paid into the CRSO for its uh, environmentally sound collection and recycling. Um, another very important thing is a very sound definition of um, the e-waste from private households because there cannot be any distinction between the source of an end-of-life lamp from uh, a commercial uh, business type use versus that of a private household. Um, health and safety uh, has to be considered also in regulation. Um, you know, consideration has to be given to um, the, the, the warehouse or the recycler and you know whether they are entitled to actually refuse waste that's being delivered to them because it's just not safe so that's important um, the the regulation around information and reporting uh, as well as the implementation of penalties so um, to pull that all together from a lamp point of view, the regulation should take into account the specifics of lamps being fragile, high volume uh, and so on. Um, and therefore, in terms of the, the government control and monitoring, the recommendation is to have a, a national scheme that's controlled by the producers, uh, which basically, in other words, uh, uh, is the CRSO example. Something that um, is not recommended would be to just simply um, have a, a product or sales tax where um, the monies would go into a, a central fund. There would be um, oversight in terms of the investment of that fund where um, <coughs> the monies collected may not be used for the intention to, to collect and recycle end of life lamps. So the strong preference is to have a, have a purpose built CRSO dedicated to the to optimising uh, the collection and recycling of end of life lamps as opposed to, to working off a tax based fund where um, it's not not as specific would be the preference. Excellent. Thank you so much for that comprehensive answer. That's great. Um, so now we have more of a technical question. So I'm going to pass this one on to Catherine. Um, and it has to do with LEDs. So the question is are LEDs safe? And can you recycle all components of an LED? Thanks for the question, Laura. So the uh, concern, are LEDs safe? I'm not sure what the background to that question is. They are an electronic device. Um, most of them are, are quite well made as long as they pass fire and safety regulations um, so that they've been certified um, you know, not to be a hazard. They should be safe to operate. Um, they have major components including electronics like the circuit board, the LED package, and the chip inside the package. The other components are plastics, which may contain phosphorus, uh, glass, which may also be coated with phosphor, and metals. Um, in particular, the aluminum heat sink in an LED um, is heavy, it's bulky, and it is something that uh, potentially can be recovered and reused quite easily. So with uh, the advent of LEDs, we have to look at them 
as part of, probably as part of the electronics waste stream, any type of consumer or office electronics. Um, they are sturdier in most cases. Most of them do not have glass. They're sturdier than compact fluorescent lamps. They do not contain any mercury. And they should be fairly easy to collect and recycle. One area for improvement um, that the industry is looking into is how to design the products so that the components can be more easily separated. Next question. Thanks very much, Catherine. Great answer. Um, so, Andrew, a question for you. It's a specifically, uh, it's from Togo, and the uh, audience members wanting to know if you know of any vendors of equipment um, who could set up a collection system in Africa. Um, they refer to your Indonesia example and wondering if there's programs like this in Africa or if they could be set up if you know of any. Um, <clears throat> I, I am aware, does that mean specifically the recycling equipment? Um, yeah, uh, industries that can recycle the lamps. And, and or yeah. yeah, I know I know in South Africa, um, they indeed have um, uh, recycling equipment in place in Johannesburg that uh, is dedicated to to the recycling and treatment of end of life lamps. That does exist. Okay, great. Um, and and we can get to the uh, to the audience member via email with more details on that. And um, Andrew, I'm going to actually wrap up with a, a final question for you, um, which is how can we involve private companies, uh, distributors, electricity producers, to participate at, in national efforts? Well, I think, I think the start point is um, wherever possible a lighting industry association exists to, to start the, uh, the dialogue with the lighting industry that will include all the producers that are importing uh, into the market in lamps for sale, um, engaging the uh, national utility to basically open the dialogue to take the direction of um, how you how you seek to regulate uh, the collection and recycling of end of life lamps, and therefore the necessity of how a CRSO should be established in your country. Um, it, the real start point is, is, the, is the dialogue with the various stakeholders, getting them involved, obviously including uh, your Ministry of Environment and, and appropriate government officials, um, to, to get it started. That's the start point. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, so now I'd like to thank everyone on behalf of the Enlighten Initiative, our speakers and our attendees for participating in today's webinar. We've had a great audience and we really appreciate your time. I invite all attendees to check the Enlighten website over the next few weeks if you'd like to view the slides and listen to a recording of today's presentation. So it will be posted for those who came in later. If your country is not already a member of the Global Efficient Lighting Partnership, we encourage you to join. We also offer expert policy assistance and the ability for you to subscribe to our e-newsletter and participate in webinars. So we hope you have a wonderful day and we hope to see you again at future Enlightened events. This concludes our webinar.